I want you to think about what the Bible claims to be. The Bible claims to be a message written by the creator God to his creation. That is a very powerful statement. Because if you've noticed, our generation's really enthusiastic about communicating to the unseen realm. Yep. That's why uh, you see our generation getting into a lot of witchcraft nowadays. There's a hunger to actually find something more than what we can see. That's why we see a lot of our young people playing and indulging in things like the Ouija board. They want a message. They're seeking for a message that doesn't come from an earthly vessel, that doesn't come from an earthly realm, but it comes from the spiritual realm. That's why our generation, and for many generations, we've been enthused with fortune telling, getting our palms read. We're, we're into the future. We really have a, ve- we have a very, very high interest into what the future holds. That's what we pay money. But what's so crazy to me is that creator God, the God of the universe, the king King of kings, the Lord of lords, doesn't want you to pay him anything, even though he's the one that holds the future. He, he doesn't want us to pay anything. He just says, receive my son as your Lord and Savior and read this love letter. Read this letter that I've given to humanity that I inspired I authored, I used men of God to pen it down, but I am the author of it. And in there, God speaks to us about our future. He speaks to us about what's to come. In there, he speaks to us about what is. And the only Jesus, only Jesus is the only one that has the ability or is the only person that really speaks about the condition of the human heart. He's the one that actually reveals the human heart. He goes deep. And so to me, to think about what the Bible claims to be, which is a message written by creator God to his creation, to me, that is powerful. Yes. Yes. Right. To me, that is actually even more than powerful. It's miraculous. Yes. And so now the question is, how does the creator God authenticate his message? How does he prove to his creation that he is the one sending the message how does he authenticate it because a lot of people might say well reading the bible and saying that you believe in god because the bible says so is like saying that you believe in batman because the comic book says so (laughs) but see what's crazy is that god authenticates his message and he primarily authenticates his message through what we call prophecy to tell the future before it happens see god is beyond time god holds history in his hands god is the creator of everything and when he is the creator of everything that also implies time god sent jesus to live in time but god is not subject to time because he is not subject to his creation So God understands and he knows everything that has happened, everything that is happening, and everything that will happen. And what's amazing is that God, through his word, the Bible, he tells us what happened, what is happening, but he also tells us what will happen. Free of charge. You don't have to go to any other sources to know what your future holds. You go to the one who holds our future. That is the Lord, Jesus Christ. So the primary way that God chooses to authenticate his message, one of the primary ways is through prophecy, to tell the future before it happens. And in the Bible, we find many, many examples where God spoke about the future and it happened. And so I want to give you a little bit of a study just very quickly. There are many more verses, but I want to stick to the subject. And the reason why I want to actually give you this evidence is so that it could have a little bit more weight when we get further into our study today about what God says in regards to the future end times. Okay, so let's start with history a little bit and let's see what God had to say about history. And let's see if it actually did happen or not. The first example that I want to show you is that God said that the island of Tyre would be destroyed. And he prophesied that in Ezekiel chapter 26, 
on 593 BC. 593 BC, God prophesied the island of of Tyre would be destroyed. Here's what Ezekiel says. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Who said it? Sovereign Lord. Who is? God. God. Here's what he says. I am your enemy, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations. How many nations? Many. I will bring many nations against you, like the waves of the sea crashing against your shoreline. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and tear down its towers. This is what the sovereign Lord says. From the north, I will bring King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon against Tyre. Now we're going to go to verse 8. First, he will destroy your mainland villages. Uh They will plunder all your riches and merchandise and break down your walls. Uh They will destroy your lovely homes and dump your stones and timbers and even your dust into the sea. Uh I will make your island a bare rock, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. You will never be rebuilt for I, the Lord, have spoken. Yes, the sovereign Lord has spoken. Uh Uh-huh. So he said that in 593 BC. That's a very threatening message. That's a very pretty hardcore judgment. He wrote this and he inspired Ezekiel to write this, 593 BC. And then King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Tyre City in 573 BC. Uh This made people flee to Tyre Island. So King Nebuchadnezzar, exactly how Jesus, exactly how the Lord said it, King Nebuchadnezzar conquered this city, the Tyre city, and it happened in 573 BC. All the people started running away to Tyre Island. Now catch this. Remember that we said many nations? Yeah. Yeah. Alexander the Great built a bridge to Tyre Island using the debris of Tyre city in 332 BC. Mm. As he crossed, as Alexander the Great crossed, his navy of many nations came from the other direction to conquer the island many nations then the muslims destroyed the island completely in 1291 a.d Mm. now a lot of people may look at the world map and said but pastor tyre island's on the world map yes that's the modern city of tyre it still exists but it exists a few miles away because the ancient city and the ancient island never got built again Mm. second example is cyrus conquers and permits jerusalem's rebuilt Isaiah 44 and 45, this was written in 700 BC. Uh It says this, when I say of Cyrus, this is God speaking. When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. This is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. The fortress gates will be opened never to shut again. So 161 years later, conqueror Cyrus fulfills this prophecy in 539 BC. Mm. How did Isaiah prophesy even the name? Mm. 161 years before Cyrus was born, how was it that Isaiah, a man, would write down this prediction, this prophecy, so, so perfectly accurate yeah. Yeah. from the name to the actions of what he would do and the city that he would rebuild, Jerusalem. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'll tell you how. God. Come on. Yeah. That's right. God is powerful. That's right. God is in control. Yes. God holds time in his hands. Yes. So predicting the future to God is absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's why 161 years before this man showed up and conquered, Isaiah could write about it because yeah. God spoke it to him. God inspired him to because God owns time. Yeah. Yeah. The word of God is not some fairy tale book. That's right. yeah. The word of God is everything. Yeah. It should be the anchor of our souls. Yeah. And here's the, here's the next example that I have. And that is the Bible predicted that Aliza, he, the Bible predicted Alexander's rise, fall, and the divided empire. Mm. God predicted that. And so in Daniel chapter 8, in 535 BC, here's what Daniel wrote. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that describes the Greek empire. Yeah. It just really conquered swiftly. 
so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn, the very large horn is the symbolism of Alexander the Great. Yeah. This goat, which had one very large horn between his eyes, the goat became very powerful. This is the Greek empire. But at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. Mm. This represents him dying, yeah. Alexander the Great dying. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth. The four prominent horns that replaced the one large horn show that the Greek empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as the first. Alexander the Great came into power in 336 BC, ruled for 13 years, then his empire divided into four, exactly like the word of God Dang. predicted it. Dang. Exactly the same. Wow. Now listen to this last comment from the National Geographic. This is what they say. I referred your inquiries to our staff archaeologist, Dr. George Stewart. He said that archaeologists do indeed find the Bible a valuable reference tool and use it many times for geographical relationships, old names and relative chronologies. On the enclosed list, you will find many articles concerning discoveries, verifying events discussed in the Bible. Alleluia. The National Geographic Society, Washington, D.C. And there are many more examples that we can talk about, but I want to stick very, very, very close to the topic today, which is not this, not the credibility of the Bible, but I did want to bring some examples to add weight so that we can actually listen with a little bit more faith in what the Bible has to say That's in regards good. to things that haven't yes. happened yet. Yeah. Yeah. So the credibility of the Bible is very impeccable. And today I want to introduce some of you to this new term that we all know as the rapture. The rapture is a very interesting term. It is highly debated. It is a topic that is heavily debated oh, amongst man. Christians, yeah. amongst scholars. Yeah. And yeah. once again, I don't want to be a pastor that wants to shove information down your throat. I don't want to be divisive either. Yeah. I respect your guys' opinion. Some of yeah. you have different views on the rapture, and we respect it 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to show you what the Lord has allowed me to come up with in regards to my research. And I want to teach those that have never heard this a view that they could actually see and then compare and contrast. And yeah. you do your own research. Yeah after this yeah, yeah. and i pray that this blesses you today Amen. so the rapture is pretty much when everyone who has accepted jesus christ as their lord and savior will get caught up in the air in a moment where jesus comes to the clouds he doesn't return to earth yet a lot of us hear the second coming of christ the second coming of christ the rapture is not the second coming of christ okay the, the bible speaks that we will meet jesus in the air so he doesn't return to earth yet oh, he's yeah. going to return to earth later yeah and so the rapture is pretty much when Jesus comes to the clouds and he picks up his church. Yeah. And that is every single person that has a very wonderful, that has a, an authentic relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We get picked up immediately, very quickly. Yeah. And we're going to read that later on. And anybody who is not in Christ, anybody who does not have a relationship with Jesus, they get what we call left behind. So all those that have a, 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 an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, we get picked up immediately. We get taken to heaven. And it's for a seven-year period that we get taken to heaven, which we're going to be looking at in a, few, in a few seconds. But everybody that is not in Christ, they're left behind. And it creates a lot of chaos, which we're going to be looking at later. So everybody that is in a relationship with Jesus... Everybody that has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will get raptured. That's good. That's right. The Lord will take them to heaven. And if you want to kind of get a small glimpse of what this could look like, here's a small little video that we have for you so that you can kind of see what the picture will look like. So here it is. Did Dad tell you about my game? Are you kidding me? You're all we talked about. He said that you were the greatest baseball player in the whole world. And you know what? What? He's right. I love you. That's too bad. Okay, so that is just an imagination of what this will look like. It's 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 almost kind of scary for those that will be left behind. <laughs> 
but the purpose of the rapture is not to scare us. Now, what's crazy to me is that not only is Hollywood talking about it, uh, but who in Hollywood is talking about it? We, we, we all know The Simpsons, right? And we've all heard of the predictions of The Simpsons. And some of them, a lot of them, a lot of the predictions that The Simpsons have made have come true. Okay, I want to show you this clip that just shocked me because they depicted exactly, exactly how we believe it's going to happen. Watch this clip from The Simpsons that they predict the rapture of the church. Here goes. Left below. I wish you'd come to church with us, sweetheart. Church? I'd rather play golf on the holiest day of the week. But honey, with recent troubles in the Mideast and other ominous signs, the rapture could soon be upon us. The rapture? Easy there, Helen. Science has shown religion is just an old wives' tale. <gasps> I'm sorry, but the only thing I'm praying for is that you take it easy on our credit cards. <laughs> mm. Oh, Mr. Thompson, uh, what if your wife finds out? It's modern times. Everyone's doing it. Where did my Christian limo driver go? My pious husband is missing. The baby I chose to have baptized is gone. Mr. Thompson, what's happening? It's the rapture, Shauna. The rapture. The virtuous have gone to heaven and the rest of us have been left below. We were fools. And because we rejected God, tacitly accepting Satan, we must suffer through the apocalypse. I thought all religions were a path to God. I was wrong. Why did I put my faith in science and technology? Okay, see, that is very crazy. It's just so precise to what the Bible, will, we're going to see very soon, really, really narrates in regards to this event. So let's read some scriptures. Here's where the Bible kind of speaks about it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. So when the rapture comes, the believers are the ones that get picked up first. They will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up. Now that caught up is a very important, important, important word. We'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus has not set foot on earth yet. It's uh -huh. in the air. This is not the second return of Christ. Yeah. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So this is where the word rapture is actually mentioned in the original language, in the language of Latin, which is the word rapturo. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, you believe in the rapture? Why would you believe in the rapture? The word rapture is not even in the Bible. Yes, it is. <laughs> you just need a Latin Bible. Yes. Uh, so I don't know why we didn't translate that word in English to rapture when clearly in the Latin word, it's rapturo. Mm -hmm. Very, very clear to understand what it means. Luke chapter 17, Jesus speaks and he says this. On that night, I guess he's going to come in the night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken. The other left. Two women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. And what's crazy is what is exactly how these you know Hollywood movies and The Simpsons predicted it. It'll be super quick. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is Paul writing. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Praise God. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. That's speaking in reference to that rapture moment, to that rapturo moment. It'll be so quick. So just imagine we're here right now in church and imagine the rapture happens. But only those who are really in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will be raptured. All the ones that are not in a relationship with Jesus 
even though you are in church, here's how this is going to play. I want you all to blink in three seconds, okay? And on three. One, two, three, blink. Now imagine you're in church listening to this message and the rapture happens right now. You blinked. Before you blinked, you're with your brothers and sisters everywhere. And then as soon as your eyes open again, everybody's gone. All those that are in an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ disappear. Raptured, caught up in the air, in the blinking of an eye. This is the rapture. After the rapture happens, then we have what we call a seven-year period titled the tribulation. So when the rapture happens, it commences what we call the tribulation. The tribulation is seven years. It's a seven-year period. And in those seven years, it is divided in half. Three years and a half, that will be obviously filled a little bit of chaos at the beginning because millions of people disappeared. Yeah. But there will be peace in a way. And at the during this seven-year period, we're going to have this person that is titled as the Antichrist rise to power. Mm-hmm. This Antichrist is going to establish peace around the world after all the chaos that just happened. But at the halfway mark of the seven years, he's going to turn on the world. And he's going to show the world who he really is. Now, the Antichrist is a man like us, but the devil incarnates into him. So it's the devil in a man because the devil always wants to imitate everything that God does. God came and became flesh through Jesus. The devil comes and he becomes flesh through the Antichrist. The devil also will have a false trinity, which will be Satan, who replaces God the Father. Uh, The Antichrist, which replaces Jesus the Son. And the false prophet, who replaces and tries to imitate the Holy Spirit. It's It's a trinity. It's a false trinity. When the Antichrist comes to power, he will actually have what we what the Bible calls a false prophet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the purpose of the Antichrist is to have a one world government, yeah. a one world order, yeah. one leader, one currency, one religion. Yeah. So the rapture happens, the seven years commence, the Antichrist comes to power, halfway he turns on the world and he creates a system. But more on this next week. Yeah. At the end of the seven year period, the war of Armageddon is what's going to happen. Mm. A lot of us have heard of Armageddon. They even made a yeah. movie titled Armageddon, but we really don't know what it is. I'll tell you what the war of Armageddon is. The war of Armageddon is when the Antichrist, which is a devil, rallies all the nations against Israel. Wow. The devil hates Israel because they're God's chosen people. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of hate towards Israel, but as Christians, as sons and daughters of God, we must stand for Israel. Yeah. doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what culture might say. It doesn't matter if you get canceled. We must stand for the people of Israel. So Satan is incarnate through the Antichrist is going to rally all the nations of the world at the end of the seven year period. And he's going to want to come against Israel to destroy Israel. But at that seven year period, once that seven year period is done, Jesus is coming back, not a sheep, not a shepherd. Sorry. He's coming as judge. He's coming as warrior. The Bible says he's going to come in a white horse with flames coming out of his eyes, a sword coming out of his mouth, tattooed on his hip, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's not coming as peasant, marginalized Jesus. He's coming as tough warrior. I'm here to defend my people. Amen? And so at the end of this tribulation period of the seven years, he comes back and he defends Israel and he completely annihilates the Antichrist and his armies. But more on this next week. (laughs) Now, there are three views on the rapture, Mm -hmm. and this is where a lot of debate happens. There are more than three views now. More modern views have come out, but the main, main views are the ones that we're going to be looking at, and I want to kind of show you what these main views are. The first view is the pre-tribulation view, and I'm going to read it to you very quickly. This is where believers believe that there will be a rapture before the start of the seven-year tribulation period. So this is where the rapture start this the the pre-tribulation uh view is when the rapture happens and then the seven year period commences after the second coming will be at the end of the seven year tribulation then jesus will be coming with the church to defeat his enemies at armageddon this is what we just described then the second view is the mid-tribulation in the mid-tribulation believers believe that the rapture will happen halfway through the seven year tribulation 
The theory is that the rapture will take place when the Antichrist turns on the world. Mm. Christ will then return again at the end of the seven years of tribulation, and he comes to defeat his enemies. That's the mid-tribulation. Mm. Then there's the post-tribulation view, and this one says that believers believe the return of Jesus will be a public single event, and the church will go through the great tribulation. Mm. The rapture will happen at the end of the seventh year. Then Jesus will return immediately to fight for his enemies, which makes no sense to lift and bring back down. <laughs> so here at Crave Church, we don't believe, and this is our view, we don't believe that we'll go through the tribulation period and we are pre-trib. So our view is pre-tribulation. Uh, once again, if you are mid-trib or post-trib, we respect you. Yeah, and right. we don't want to fight over these things. Yes. Uh, this, and when it comes to this view, I believe is a secondary issue, not a primary issue. Yes. Once again, a primary issue is you and I debating if Jesus Christ is Lord or not, mm -hmm. or if he's the only way, the truth, and the life. That, to me, is a primary issue. Uh, baptism is a primary issue to me. The Trinity is a primary yeah. issue to me. Yeah. We, we can divide over that. But when it comes to secondary issues, whether if you believe uh, pre-trib, post, or mid-trib, I really don't care. Um, this is just where we stand and yeah. we respect. We can still worship together. Yeah. We can still pray together. Yeah. We can still share the gospel yeah. together, right? And so there should be no disagreement in regards to our unity. I think yeah. that we can be united even though we don't see eye to eye on secondary issues. Yeah. So we're pre-trib. Um, I don't believe that we'll go through the tribulation period. The tribulation period is God's wrath upon all the, uh, upon all those that were left behind. It's God's wrath upon the earth. And if you're a Christian, that means that you're not subject to God's wrath because Jesus took all the wrath that was from God to you when he yeah. died on a cross. Yeah, that's right. The great, the tribulation period is just God's display of his wrath on the world. Mm. It's just, that's, and that's God's nature. God's nature is to consume sin. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like fire. Fire's nature is to consume whatever touches it. We can't be like, bad fire for burning. <laughs> That's illogical. Yeah. Because it's in the fire's nature to burn. Yeah. God's nature is to consume sin. We can't be like, That's so unfair. That's bad. Bad God. No. <laughs> it's his nature to consume sin. Yeah. And so the rapture is a hopeful event for those that belong to Christ. Yeah. And those that are left behind, they will experience the wrath of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There will be judgments that are such horrible things. Yeah. If you read in the book of Revelations, I believe in chapter 8, you know, John writes, and he writes what Jesus himself tells him to write. Wow. And Jesus tells him about the judgments that will come. Mm -hmm. That they will come. And uh, they're represented by seven seals seven bowls and seven trumpets yeah. seven seals seven bowls seven trumpets you can do your own research on the seven seals seven bowls and seven trumpets but all these things i believe are judgments that will happen during the tribulation period of seven years they're horrible things if you thought coronavirus was terrible this pales 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 in contrast what what is going to be happening here a world disasters Things that are out of science's control, wow. yeah. things that are out of money's control, yeah. they are terrible things. I didn't want to go over them because I believe that they're just so crazy that um, I'd rather just tell you and then you research that on your own time. Mm -hmm. So the tribulation period is God's wrath on those that are left behind. Yeah. But if you're Christian, you're not subject to the wrath of God because Jesus took your place. Yeah. That's why I don't believe that we should. The people, um, the, the believers that believe in the post-tribulation theory, they think that the church needs to go through it. That they need to experience the wrath of God to be purified. Um, I, I personally don't believe that because Jesus took the wrath that belonged to me and my punishment. Jesus took it on the cross. It's the message of the gospel. And it's also not in God's pattern to allow his wrath to fall on those who belong to him. For example, if you take a look at the story of Noah, God warned Noah and took him out of the wrath yeah. before he allowed the flood to happen. Yeah. If you look at Lot, who was in Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God warned him and took him out before judgment fell. Yeah. It's in God's pattern to warn us and to remove us from his wrath. Yeah. Now, it's up to us if we take the warning or not, yeah. right? Uh, this whole series is a warning for yeah, all of us. Yeah. 
of the things that are to come. So that's why Jesus says, you know, don't get caught up in the affairs of this world. Yeah. Don't get caught up. Escape what's coming. Yeah. Because what's coming is real. Yeah. It's tremendous. And Jesus has some pretty interesting things that he has to say about how severe it's going to be. We're going to read that in a bit. So what happens after the rapture? After the rapture, number one, chaos worldwide. Mm. Millions of people just disappeared. Imagine Christian pilots that drive a plane. Planes falling everywhere. Imagine how many people that are cooking in their homes, raptured, stoves go on fire, homes and complete buildings on fire. Imagine all the vehicles that are going to be driven by people who are Christians in that moment of the rapture. How many car accidents? How many cars off bridges? Just imagine every the, the chaos that's going to happen in that moment. There's going to be chaos, worldwide chaos. There's going to be disaster. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be people going crazy, wondering what happened to, to their loved ones. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of confusion because no one's going to know. Not a lot of people will know. I'm guessing that a lot of it's going to, a lot of the blame is going to be put on the UFOs. Yeah. Maybe. But just imagine the cries of women losing their children. Wow. Just imagine the cries of young teenagers wondering where their parents went. Just imagine the cries uh, and the plea of help and ans wanting answers of husbands wondering where their wives and their children went. Yeah. There's going to be chaos worldwide. Yeah. Number two, the tribulation period commences. This is what's going to happen after the rapture. The tribulation period commences. Seven years of tribulation, but the second half is called the great tribulation. Yeah. And Jesus spoke about it. And this is what I was telling that we were going to read about what Jesus said. Look what, what Jesus says in Matthew 24. It says, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house during this time. And let him who is in the field don't even go back to get clothes. But woe, meaning this is terrible. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight, you running away, may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, your day of rest. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no one would be saved. But for the chosen sake, those days will be shortened. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus. Yeah. This is not Paul. Yeah. This is not John. Mm -hmm. This is not the little brother of Jesus, James. Mm -hmm. This was Jesus himself saying, yeah. it's going to be so bad, you shouldn't even go back home to get clothes. Wow. And I hope that when you're running from persecution during these days, I hope that it's not in the winter that you're running. For those that are nursing babies, I hope it's, it's, it's woe to you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be terrible that there has never been this type of anguish on earth yet. Wow. A lot of people say, and they interpret this passage as, well, this was not for the future. This was in reference to the people of the era of Jesus mm -hmm. when the emperors would persecute the Christians. Can I say something? Jesus saying, this type of suffering has not happened yet. And it'll never happen again. There's a persecution that's coming during the tribulation, which is the first three years and a half. And then when the Antichrist turns, it commences the great tribulation that Jesus is speaking about, where the Antichrist is going to persecute people. But more on that next week. Jesus says, no one would be able to be saved. But for the chosen sake, those days will be shortened. The only reason why it's three years and a half is because if it goes any longer, no one would survive the persecution and the anguish that's coming to the world. Yeah. Wow. The Great Tribulation will make Hitler's Holocaust look like a walk in the park, wow. like a stroll in the park. Mm -hmm. If we think that the Holocaust was terrible, which was yeah. detrimental, evil, satanic, yeah. what's coming is worse because it's not for one nation. It's for the world. Wow. So the tribulation period commences after the rapture. Then number three, the Antichrist and the new world order. Social disruption 
will give rise to this personality known as the Antichrist. The world will be so chaotic that we'll be looking, they will be looking, we will, the world will be looking for someone to bring order to the chaos. Yeah. So they're going to look to this one world leader. Yeah. And I don't know if you've heard politics, I don't know if you're into all that, but they've been talking about a one world order since the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. This is a plan that's been happening well, and yeah. it's been trying to get unfold. It's unfolding slowly, but surely. Yeah. Yeah. This Antichrist will bring, and the Bible speaks about many Antichrists, 1st of John and 2nd John, 3rd John. John speaks about the spirit of Antichrist. But when we're talking about the Antichrist, we're speaking about one person in specific. Yeah. Daniel, the book of Daniel, speaks about him. There are many, the book of Thessalonians also speak of him, the lawless one. He has different titles, but it's all in reference to one man that is going to govern the whole world. He's going to be in, it's going to be possessed by Satan himself. The atmosphere of the world will be completely satanic. It'll be wow. dark during these seven years. Wow. He will bring world peace and will win the favor of the world to carry out the new world order. Yeah. A one world government, meaning one religion, one currency, and one leader. Wow. If you're paying attention to the news, <laughs> that's already starting to happen. Yeah. Yeah. They want one leader. The world wants one currency. Yeah. They want one religion. Mm. And it's all under the name of unity. But don't let those titles catch you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a satanic agenda. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That we will not be able to prevent. Because yeah. it has to happen. Yeah. Mm. What we can prevent is living through it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, number four, right after the rapture, right? Chaos worldwide. There's going to be the great tribulation period that commences, the Antichrist and the New World Order. And number four, the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 13 speaks about the mark of the beast. It says this, he acquired everyone. Who's he? The Antichrist. Mm -hmm. He acquired, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, mm -hmm. to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, oh. which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Mm -hmm. Now catch this. When the Antichrist turns and he commences this period of great tribulation, he's going to come up with a system. The system is what Revelation 13 is calling the mark of the beast. Now, I don't think it's going to be a microchip. It might be. I don't think it's going to be a vaccine either. It might be. We don't know. And it's not the vaccine for Corona. Yeah. So chill. Also, <laughs> stop trying to look for the Antichrist. You're not going to find him. And if you find him, that means you were left behind. <laughs> so there's no point in trying to pick it. Now listen to me. This mark of the beast is something interesting. Because without the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. Mm. Think about this. This past summer... We were praying, and all of a sudden, lightning hit my house, and all the power went out. We couldn't charge our phones. We couldn't turn on the TV. We had no heater. We had no light. Now, that is just the essentials of a home. Now, imagine if you need the mark of the beast to buy and sell, and you can't buy or sell anything. That means, where are you going to live? What are you going to buy to eat? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that you can go to some stores nowadays and they will not accept your cash and say, sorry, we don't accept cash. And you can't buy anything even if you have the cash in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Now imagine when you don't have that mark. You can't buy. If you have a headache, you can't buy Tylenol. If you're thirsty, you can't grab a bottle of water. There's no heat for your home. The last month that you're going to be able to live inside your home will be the last month before that thing, that system comes to play. Now, here's the crazy thing, that once you take the mark of the beast, you sealed your fate after those seven years. But what if you have a newborn and he needs to eat? Are you going to watch it starve to death? Or are you going to mark yourself and mark that child so that child can eat? What if you're really, really hungry, but you can't? Because if you mark yourself, you seal your fate. Whoever takes the mark of the beast has sealed your fate. After those seven year period, you can't be saved, you can't be restored, and you can't be redeemed. You're condemned to go to hell forever. Wow. Yeah. But if you don't take the mark, you can't buy nor sell. Mm -hmm. You can't post something 
on Facebook market and sell it. It's not going to work. And here's the crazy thing that I believe that's going to happen. That the devil is going to actually persecute people to have that mark. He's going to want. Just look at what's happening with this vaccine. There are rumors and a lot of conversations happening saying the world, the nation will have to get a vaccine even if it goes against your will. That's just a vaccine. What are you going to do when Satan's in power? I believe that many people will be tortured to get this mark before they execute them. Because it's either you get the mark or you get executed. But if you get executed, go to heaven. Your spirit makes it. But if you don't, you get the mark. You're going to live seven years, maybe comfortable. But nothing else can save you after that. Nothing else can save you after that. But more on this next week when we do the chapter on the Antichrist and how he's going to reign. Now, after the seven years of tribulation come to a close, the Antichrist will lead the world's armies to destroy all of Israel. And that's when Jesus returns to earth for the second time. This is his second return. He'll come in full power to fight for Israel and he will show and throw Satan. He's going to show Satan who's boss and he's going to throw Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And then that seven-year period comes to an end. Mm -hmm. And that seven period commences what we know as the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he will reign on earth for a thousand years. Whoa. But more on that later. <laughs> so I want to look at some frequently asked questions about the tribulation. And I want to answer these questions to you because I'm sure that some of you might have them. Here's the first one. Why are you trying to scare people with the rapture nonsense? <laughs> It's a good question. The purpose of this conversation isn't to have a scare tactic that will freak people into Christianity. Yeah. I just want to tell you that from the beginning, in the middle, and now at the end. Mm -hmm. We teach this because it's biblical. It's a biblical teaching that Jesus yes. himself spoke yes. about. Yes. And it's a warning of what's to come. Yes. If a blind man was walking towards the edge of a cliff, it would be completely foolish to say, don't warn him! Don't warn him that he's going to die because if you warn him, you're going to scare him. <laughs> Wouldn't you say stupid? That's just complete foolishness. Yeah. Same thing if there was a tsunami coming to Vancouver City. If a tsunami was coming to Vancouver City, do you think it'd be stupid for me to tell people to get their stuff packed up and make it, book it to the mountains? Of course not. So in the same way, Jesus warns us yeah. of what's to come. Yeah. Yeah. This event called the rapture is coming. Yeah. The tribulation period is coming. Yeah. It's not a scare tactic. It's a love tactic. Yeah. Yeah. Where we love our people enough to tell them what's to come so that they can prepare yeah. that's right. That's right. and make the decisions they need to make so that they could escape what is to come. Yeah. Right. The rapture isn't about fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead, it's about our greatest hope. It's hope yeah. Yeah. because we get to escape God's just and righteous judgment. Yes. Second question. What if my family and friends miss the rapture? Well, I want to tell you that that would not be the worst thing that could happen to them. Yeah. Something worse would be if your loved ones would die without Christ. Yeah. Sealing their eternal fate wow. in hell. Wow. Yeah. Sealing their eternal fate. Dying without Christ is the worst thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. If your family and your loved ones miss the rapture and they don't get taken... It's not the worst thing that can happen. It is a terrible thing, though. That's why the Holy Spirit placed the family. And I'm trusting him. Yeah. Yeah. That if he said, you know, if he placed family in my heart, mm -hmm. I'm trusting that he does want to do something in your family. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trusting him. He wants to do something in your family. Yeah. But you need to partner with him. If you don't take advantage of this moment mm -hmm. where Jesus is saying, I want to move in your family, but you need to do your part. You need to do your part. Yeah. God is doing his. Mm -hmm. yes. He's letting us know yeah. that he wants to work in your family. Yes. That he cares about your family. Yes. That he loves every single member in your family. Yeah. Yeah how foolish it would be for you not to take advantage of this opportunity mm -hmm. just because you're afraid or you're scared of their opinion. Mm -hmm. If he said it, trust it. Do it. Yeah. And with your own eyes, you will see the fruit. 
that your obedience will bear. Amen. Amen? But this leads to my next question. Question three. Can people in the tribulation still be saved? Yes. If they're left behind in the tribulation period, they'll have an opportunity to confirm everything that you had spoken to them about Christ before you were raptured. This will be the greatest evidence to them that everything you said was true and they can still be saved during the tribulation. But persecution will happen. God's wrath will be released on earth and the mark system will happen and martyrdom, martyrdom will be rampant. This period of time will make the Holocaust look like a stroll in the park. Wow. Your family can still be saved and they will be. But persecution will happen. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist is going to persecute anyone that doesn't want to receive the mark. Mm -hmm. He's going to persecute people that believe. He's going to persecute the new converts that will believe. Because the truth is this. When people are living through that, and they remember everything you said before you got raptured, mm -hmm. they're going to want to believe in Christ. Yeah. And they're going to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Well, yeah. But look at me. This is why you should care enough for your family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would you want them to go through persecution? Yeah. Martyrdom? Why would you want them to go through this system of the mark of the beast? Wow. Can, you, can you deny your fear, your insecurity to speak to them? Can you deny yourself so you can reach out to them? Chapter 2 is going to be incredible. I think chapter 2 might be the strongest chapter wow. next week. This is a chapter that you want to bring your family to. Yes. Because they're walking through a cliff maybe. Yeah. It'd be foolish not to warn them and say, hey, you're going to die. Yeah. Here's the fourth question. Should we care about the end time signs? Should we care about them? So there are a lot of hyper end times spiritual people <laughs> that they're looking for signs under the coffee cup. <laughs> and they're just trying to like, you know, pinpoint who they're like, Obama is the antichrist. <laughs> or tr Trump is the antichrist. Or Biden's <laughs> Pope Francis. And and they're just trying to find a whole bunch of things and they're really crazy and, you know, everything's assigned to them. Yeah. Now, I don't want us to ever go into that and, you know, go to that extreme. Yeah. But the truth is this, that yes, God always warns us like loving parents and he does give us signs yeah. and we should yeah. yield to those signs. Yeah. Watch this. God gave Noah and the people of his day 120 years of warning. Wow. You can read on Genesis chapter 6. Lot and his family were given a warning before judgment came. The Egyptians were given 10 warning signs. You can read that in Exodus chapter 5. A 40-day warning was given to Nineveh. You can read that in Jonah chapter 3. Yeah. And Jesus gave the nation of Israel a warning 37 years before her destruction in Matthew chapter 24. What I want you to understand is that God warns his people before judgment falls. And he saves those who are obedient. Mm -hmm. yeah. He will do this before the start of the tribulation with specific warning signs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he's going to save us through the rapture. Mm -hmm. The rapture is not an event of fear. It's an event to be thankful for. Right. Right. Thankful that he's warning you right now. Listen to yeah. me. Listen to me. This world is coming to an end, man. Mm -hmm. I don't know when. But everything is just a dress rehearsal for this. Everything that we're seeing right now, even through this coronavirus pandemic, it's a dress rehearsal. Yeah. The system of this world is rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And the Christians are very comfortable. Just focused on what I can post on Instagram. Jesus is warning you. God is warning us. This is something we need to pay attention to. The signs are there. We're just very comfortable. Yeah. And your family matters. Yeah. Yeah. I conclude by saying this. When I travel, I like to travel with confirmation. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I want to confirm seats. So when I get my boarding pass, it has my number and it has my row. Mm -hmm. I like traveling with my confirmed seat. Mm -hmm. A couple summers ago, we were traveling to a conference. And there were a lot of weather complications with the flights. And all the flights got messed up. And all of our seats got lost. So we ended up traveling on standby. That's very interesting. Traveling on standby sucks. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Because traveling on standby means you're not confirmed. Mm-hmm. Traveling on standby means that I hope I get to make it. <laughs> it means I hope there's room for me in the next flight. When you ask people today, where are you going to spend your eternity? They say things like, well, I hope it's in heaven. They're trying to go to heaven on standby. But not me. And I hope that not you. I don't want to risk and travel on standby. I want my confirmed seat. And let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is your only way to heaven. Only Jesus can confirm your seat. Only Jesus can confirm your family's seat. Jesus is your only way. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Something crazy is coming. I bet that this video that is playing right now will be played later on. Mm. And people are going to be in for a shock. But not the people of God. Because we don't live in darkness. We live in light and we know what's coming. So I pray that this first chapter, this introduction, is, hope that it convinces you. Mm -hmm. But at least... At the least, I hope that this information kind of surges a curiosity in some of you who are skeptical to go and do your research. Pay attention to the government. Pay attention to the government. Pay attention to how the government is running right now. And contrast it to what the word of God is saying. I leave you with this. And uh, your campus pastor is going to go on stage right now. And I love you. And if I share these things... It's only because I do care. And I want you to know that a lot of people would probably say, you shouldn't be speaking about this during a pandemic and a lot of name calling could happen. (laughs) You shouldn't be instilling fear into people during a pandemic. They've already had enough. But I tell you the truth that from the bottom of my heart, my heart is not to instill fear. My heart is just to warn you. And the Holy Spirit really placed it in my heart that this was the time we needed to speak on this. We're going to speak about it earlier um, in the year, but he confirmed that this was the time that I need to speak on it. I pray that this information blesses you, that it instills something in your spirit, yeah. curiosity. I yeah. pray that it, dis- it may disturb and interrupt your schedule yeah. so that you can actually pay attention to the things that matter most. Mm-hmm.